Welcome back to the Hawkins Reports, a Stranger Things podcast by LSG Media. I'm your host, Dean. I'm Jessica. I'm Matthew. On this week's episode, we're talking Season 2, Chapter 3, The Polywalk. All right, we're back for some Polywog action, and we're bringing in LSG Media favorite, Matthew Anderson, to join Jessica and I. He's going to class this up a little bit, I guess. Yeah. Jessica and I can't handle it by ourselves. I was, no, I was here for, uh, what was that, episode five I was on last season, I think? I we already remember. forgot it wasn't that bad. No, just kidding. It didn't leave, <laughs> oh, hey, didn't, okay. leave an, didn't leave an impression. Don't know. Can't remember. <laughs> Fantastic. You were on some Wonderful. episode, you know. <laughs> good to have you, buddy. Glad you're here. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing good. I rushed home to be a part of this. Rushed, I tell yeah. you. I was so pumped for this. That's good. It's good to see that when motivated, you yes, can be on time. I was just Fuck. thinking that. That's nice. I'm like, you know what? Matthew can make it a reasonable This is going to go into his annual LSG Media review. Review, yes, yep. under punctuality and timing. I cannot wait oh, to you, write about it. Your review got a lot of marks here lately with your internet connection, <laughs> Dean. I'm sorry. A <laughs> lot of cool. red pin. My internet connection? It's actually just the state God of Massachusetts. Right. I, wish you could send, I wish you could send me pictures of your speed tests. Oh, my God. Listen, right. we didn't Moving even have on. running water, okay? So I don't even want to hear about... Matt, <laughs> opening impressions of Polywog. Let's get cracking. I like every episode so far, which I, you know, like you guys, I stopped myself because I knew I was going to be on the show. I was like, I can't watch episode going, four yet. Going but tantric? You wanted fucking, to real fucking bad, didn't you? I fucking did. I, I did. Watch it but I also... But, I am somebody who's not a binge watcher. Like, I like spreading this out. I mean, like, an episode every other day, every two or three days is, is enough for me. Like, I don't want to plow through it too quickly. I like enjoying Stranger Things while I got it, because we're going to have to wait a whole other fucking year, if not more. Um, but, man, it's fucking great. It's great. It, they, they, they've they so far captured the whole atmosphere and the feeling of the first season and the charm of the kids. It's all, there. like, none of it has has worn off in any way that, that I can tell. I've, I've been enjoying it just as much as I did the first season. Um, yeah, man, I fucking, I really enjoyed this episode. I have a few, I, I would say my only, not, not even really a complaint. I just start, I'm a little bit worried about what they're going to do with Dustin as a character in this season. This episode has me a little bit, not worried about it, I would say, but I'm just kind of like, I'm kind of wondering where they're going with him uh, as far as like a season long arc. Um, but that all said, I still love getting longer, you know, more time spent with Lucas and Dustin. That was something we talked about a little bit last season. I think of like, I love, we all love these characters. I want to see them more because last season was so, you know, tightly focused on, on Mike and Eleven and, you know, Will towards the very, very end. Uh, but, but I'm, I'm liking this, this longer visitation with the kids and, and the new kid, Max. Like, I, I just enjoyed that, this episode, getting more time spent with them, you know, dealing with each other and, and seeing kind of the depth growing there between uh, Mike and, and Will. That was cool. That's cool stuff. Um, and I guess, I guess I, we'll just have to get more into it as far as, but my overall impression, man, I enjoyed the hell out of this. Yeah. One of the things we've talked about on this, uh, on this pod is, is that actual thing is that everyone has had something to do and it's cool to see Lucas and Dustin together because they're not just tied to one of the main characters with this major through line. They're doing their own thing. And uh, and we're continuing to see that here. Obviously, the the titular polywog is in fact the important piece of this, even though it's not really a polywog, but whatever. The point is that we are seeing Dustin doing something and um, he being involved with something, so to speak. And uh, a very interesting decision for him to hide this thing at the end of the episode. Of course, we'll talk about that. But uh, Jessica, what were some of your impressions? I like this episode a lot, especially the ending of the episode. Um, I, unlike Matt love to binge watch things. I have a really hard time waiting, like a really hard time. And Dean will attest to this. I try to get him to watch like four episodes of television a night. And if he watches Whoa. two, that is like really pushing him. If I'm home alone, <laughs> I'll watch an entire season of television. I don't actually care. I don't even feel bad about it. Uh, so this has been very hard for me because when this episode ended, all I wanted to do was start episode four. It was the hardest thing in my life to press. Are you gonna are you menu. gonna leap off the microphone as soon as we're done and go watch episode four? The answer to that question is yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I probably will too. <laughs> but I, I like this episode a lot. Um, I, I I love the end, obviously. But in general, I like that it was very Dustin heavy. 
I liked the interactions. Not even the interactions. I liked Will this episode. And I talked a little bit last episode about how I feel like I was worried about Will and how Will was going to work as a character since we didn't get a lot of him last season. I didn't even know how good the actor was. And in this episode, it really cemented for me that, like, this kid is good and is, is going to do a really, really good job. He was fantastic this episode. So I'm very high and well right now. Good shit. Awesome. Well, awesome impressions uh, from you two chuckleheads. Let's dive right into the opening here with Dustin. Uh, right where we left off, in fact, he's going inside. His mother asks him about his Halloween experience. Uh, he calls it tubular, which, of course, is... Totally tubular. Making fun of Max's <laughs> California thing they were, were speculating. Mom says he's acting weird. He explains that he made a cool fake trap. Um, and I wrote, this fucking kid has something from the upside down in his fake Ghostbusters trap. Mm -hmm. That's fucking so meta. Day. Uh, he dumps the creature into Yertle the turtle's cage. He Which is awful. He Yertle. evicts this turtle. Rude. <laughs> he evicts Yertle. And of course, uh, he feeds this thing new nougat. What do you call that shit? Nougat. It's so yeah, shitty. Nougat. Milky Way. And not Milky Way. Wait, Three Musketeers. Let's so this has been blowing up on the Stranger Things, you know, LSG media Thank page. You. Uh, let's talk about this just for, for a quick Three pause Three Musketeers. There. Thank you. Ten. What, what are your thoughts? Three. No. Oh, go. Sorry, Dean. Sorry. Three Musketeers can eat all the dicks in the in the Hawkins. Fuck you. Every Fuck you. Dick, I love Three Musketeers. Every every swinging dick in Hawkins can go yum, 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 right in the fucking Milky Way's mouth. Not Milky Way. Milky Way <laughs> oh is caramel, God. too. Excuse me. Excuse me. Three Musketeers. Milky Ways are fantastic. They mm -hmm. all... The, Milky Way and... What's the other one you just said? Snickers. S no, you didn't say Snickers. They have nougat. Yeah, Three Musketeers and Milky Way all can suck Snickers dick. Oh, <laughs> Snickers chocolatey dick. S <laughs> yes. Snickers just... Screw you. Snickers is literally a Three Musketeers. No. A Milky Way is a Three Musketeers with caramel, and Snickers is a Three the Musketeers with... The most superior of them. Yes. Peanuts. It's the natural evolution. <laughs> Baby Ruth overall... It's, it's, it's the, it's, it's the national evolution. National? Why national? If, natural evolution of all those shittier bars is the Snickers. They finally got well, it right. Sometimes you just ridiculous. want some good nougat and you don't want any chewy caramel. Well, he's right. creating a monster will, by feeding it I shit will, candy. I stand with <laughs> Jessica on this fight. But now when it comes to Reese's, death to don't Jessica. Even get me started on that shit. <laughs> that is the only candy that matters. No other candies even fucking Ugh. matter. Peanut butter, overrated. <laughs> so good. Wow. You're wrong. You are so wrong, <laughs> sir. Like, objectively. Twizzlers, damn it. Big Bad Ben Ew. in the chat. <laughs> I was on his side because he was voting for Twix. Now he brings up Twizzlers, the garbage of all candies. That's my dad's favorite candy. I don't uh, know who you are, sir. Tw wow. Twix is pretty good, but but Sour to say Three Musketeers is better than these other candies is, what are you, how long have you been with ISIS, man? It's better than Twizzlers. <laughs> are you even an American? <laughs> Jesse well, Bev is eating a Reese's right now. I'm so jealous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let's continue. All right. So he names his creature D'Artagnan. Or Dart for short. Or Dart for short. Uh, Dustin falls asleep. D'Artagnan grows a bit. <laughs> uh, never feed it after midnight, I suppose. Yeah. And then, boom, the title card comes up. And we go right into some snow. Uh, snow has been the weather effect that is reminding us that we are in the past. Yes. Um, so we see, much like we did in the second episode, we see what, what looks like, anyway, an unprompted memory. Because a lot of times these flashbacks are memory prompts, but when they shoot them at the beginning of the episode like they did last time, it was not necessarily at the behest of a, of a memory, correct? Yeah. It's right. a little bit different. Um, and this is pretty important. So we're kind of seeing how she followed Hopper and how they sort of came to be. Eleven is watching Hopper place the food. Eleven is woken up by Hopper in the present. She gives him the rollover. Uh, still not talking, he asks. I guess I'll have to enjoy this triple decker ego on my own. Um, I am loving their newfound stepfather, stepdaughter relationship. Me too. It's pretty I, good. It's warming my heart. Wilford, I want him to be my dad. I, I heard Wilford Brimley looked at that waffle and died. So much sugar. I don't understand. <laughs> Brutal. Oh, my diabetes. My diabetes can't take that. <clears throat> anyway, um, Eleven brings up, now do you get it? Do you know who Wolf of Brimley is? I don't remember. I didn't Google I him. am all right now. Can I come back inside? You saw him in Thing. Anyway. Oh, yeah. duh. Can Sorry. I come back inside? I'm feeling a lot better. Names are hard <laughs> for me sometimes. 
I feel good. I feel yeah. better. I can. I'm a lot better. Can I come inside, McCready? But you know what? I just need a little nibble off you. <laughs> can I, I'll, I'll give me some Twizzlers or some Nerds or something. <laughs> um. Anyway, Eleven brings up Mike, and um, she comments how he needs me. And I guess one of the things we're noticing is that outside of her little astral projection walk, where she visits Mike, in a sense, by way of using the upside down as a this mirror universe, she. Um, she can well, sense he's in it, pain. She can sense he's in pain. Totally. And she's, you know, one, what I liked about that sequence in the last episode, it's it's like the way she used it when she was in the laboratory. Yeah. Like, she's not, she's not in the upside down in that moment when she's visiting Mike. She's just kind of, like, in between dimensions, kind of like where it's, it's like I, I, I've i been imagining it kind of like the um the hallways and, like, the Matrix Reloaded, how it's, like, it's just kind of this weird between space where she can kind of connect mm. to other things because that's not the upside down. Uh, but she could enter the upside down through there if she wanted to, I think. Yeah. Um, Ergo, it's like, it's, she can see it. <laughs> Ergo. Ergo. Fucking, yeah, Colonel Sanders looking mm-hmm. motherfucker in there waiting for her. White guy in a white suit. Ergo. <laughs> well, well, what I like about this is that Hopper knows that she does this. Yeah. So mm. we're developing this trust between them that I think, and I know she has nobody else to talk to, but Eleven strikes me as the type to keep that information very private. And the fact that Hopper is aware that she does this and that they converse about it, I was very surprised. I think that that's a good way to show how close their relationship has become. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, I'm his like, advice, wait to see him in person, you know. And he even offers, like, you want me to go check on him. If she's worried about him, like, he's still willing to, he's trying to meet her halfway all the time, it seems like. Mm-hmm. Well, Hopper, Hopper promises she'll see him soon, and that's when we get into, a, I feel like I'm making progress with these people. That's something Hopper says. That's an interesting line, right? Yeah, these people. we're right? going to see sure. more about it later. Uh, and then he continues. Uh, you say, oh, she says, you say soon. 21 days, 205, 326. Oh, Friends don't lie. When is, is soon? Best fucking moment. It's awesome. I, I love this scene. Great argument. <laughs> It it's blows like Jessica up. Jessica yelling at her dad when she gets her driver's license. Yeah. You said soon. You promised. Friends uh, don't lie, dad. Hopper says that when it's not dangerous anymore, of course, she uh, gets pissed off and has a little psionic meltdown <laughs> and uh, blows his fucking breakfast all over his chest. And uh, she says, friends don't lie. And she storms off. Good shit. It's important it. that we have conflict here too, right? This can't be all hunky dory, and we've right. seen an inherent conflict in every episode, just based on, you know, in the first two episodes. Well, in the first episode, the the conflict is is just the situation in general, which is here's this girl who's isolated from any normalcy. That's a conflict, and then it becomes Hopper's late, and now it becomes I'm upset with Hopper because I am starting to realize that I'm never going to get what I'm looking for here because it'll never be safe enough. Well, what I, what I think is interesting about the whole scenario of her being here with Hopper, like it's really in a lot of ways similar to what she's already been in for the majority of her life, like locked away, kept away in a place that she cannot leave, Correct. doesn't have any option to communicate with anybody. Obviously, it's much different because Hopper is somebody who cares about her, at least gives a shit and is trying to, to help her and protect her and you know is building a kind of relationship. So, you know, there's that, but at the same time, it's funny because I think she's actually good at enduring this. I mean, she's been here, when the show starts in the second season, she's been here for a year Mm -hmm. in this one room, well, I guess two room cabin just by herself most of the time as a kid. I can't imagine how mind numbing it is. I don't think most kids could even handle it, and she probably only can because of all her time spent in isolation. But I could all, I totally sympathize with her just like outrage of like, how much fucking longer do I have as like a, what, 10 year old girl fucking sit in a room by myself? all the time like this is a horrible life i'm being forced to live when is soon like i totally i totally get her anger and at the same time this is good conflict because i sympathize completely with each side of it like hopper's right as far as like you can't really go out you can't really leave here and i can't give you any hard timeline on when it's gonna be safe to um you can't say that and but at the same time i can totally see why she'd be fucking tired of this uh, not that what I'm about to say discounts anything you just said because it all makes perfect sense to me. But one thing I was trying to to figure out, and Jessica and I were thinking about this too, I wonder how long she's actually been in the cabin versus how much time she spent on her own. 
I feel like the only way we could really get an indication of that maybe is to kind of maybe try to spot hair length. So I'm back right at the five minute mark where she and Hopper kind of exchange looks when she's out in the snow. And I feel like I can see a little tuft of hair in the back. I can't tell if they're trying to hide it or not, but I, but if that's the case, if her hair had grown out, she spent a lot of fucking time in the woods. You have to pay attention to the weather too. Right. Because we know that this all happened approximately a year ago on the end of October, the beginning of November. That's a great point. We're thinking snow is, I don't know, I don't know anything about Indiana, but snow is normally December into January. So we're talking, she had to have been out there for at least a month to two months. Right? Mm -hmm. I, I feel like in the last episode, I'm like, it was at least weeks. But the more I think about it, I think it's, it's not had impossible to have been longer. for snow to, to snow to fall in October, though. But I but I feel like they're showing us snow for a specific reason because they want us to think, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's not going to be like a weird freak snowstorm in October. You're supposed to get that reference, you know? Yeah. That, if they're that, showing us snow, there's a reason. Sure. And, and the hat might be a clever attempt at maintaining. It's cold. That. I my I also thought that when it cuts to Hopper out there in the woods in the snow, leaving the the waffles, that that was the same night that we saw at the end of season one. Because at the end of season one, when yes. he's leaving the waffle, it doesn't look like it's the first time he's doing it. Like it looks like he's already been doing that for a little I, while. I don't, I don't think it is because she's wearing that hunter's hat. The first episode. we don't see her at all in the first season. No, the first I, season. I, oh, oh, first we, season. Got it. Got yeah. It. Yeah. And yeah, like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's the first time he's doing it. Yes, I agree with you. I thought you meant, I thought you're trying to correlate that to this, like this was the first time. No, but, oh, yeah. you just made a great point, Matt, because I was thinking like maybe she got the waffles the first time and the second time she waited for him. But you're right. The first time he left the waffles, it was more, the weather, it wasn't snowing. He definitely had done it multiple times, mm -hmm. which I didn't I think, think so. about the last time we talked about it, but I think that's correct. Yeah, I'm not sure how much it actually matters. It was just a curiosity for me. It's the crux of the entire it series, matters. Dean. Okay. We got to nail it down tonight. Okay. I want specific timelines. <laughs> I want an exact date. Got you it. don't want a flow yes. chart? Yes, okay. Your Honor. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll tighten up my defense. Oh, my That's God. Good. So, anyway, Joyce, Will, and Jonathan, um, he's staying here now. How am I going <laughs> to do my blow? <laughs> 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 I better drive uh, around in it so that they can't find it at the house. <laughs> How am I going to do my bumps off of Nancy's? Never mind. Wow. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay. Getting a little wild. Wow. A little wild doing bumps off of Nancy. Um, no. But uh, Joyce, Will, and Jonathan, she can't find her keys, of course. Uh, Bob stayed the night. Jonathan's not crazy about this. Bob offers to take Will to school in the Bobmobile. Bing, 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 Bobmobile. Um, Dude, I yeah. fucking love Bob. I don't uh, care what he says. Me I too. Love him. He's pretty hard not to love. He's I don't, great. I, I went to work and everybody's talking about the show. I'm like, where were the guy Bob? They're like, yeah, the Bob Mobile. Like all these like these like dudes that I work with are like, huh, Bob Mobile. That's all I wanted to talk about. I'm like guys, <laughs> no. relax on Bob. Let him they be. They need to get okay? out. I think. Just, just don't be in the Bob Mobile. Balls deep in the Bob Mobile. They need to get out more. <laughs> <laughs> just gonna that was my favorite part of this season. <laughs> <laughs> all right let's talk about dustin um he gets some books from the library he's trying I, to do research onto his new pet and um it's pretty important because uh, he's trying to figure it out and this is something we're dustin to do as matt was saying uh, he calls his books paddles on his journey uh, his curiosity journey he runs away from this <laughs> librarian that i found strangely sexy me too damn oh i think she's God. so hot high five on that yes 100 yeah i think she's a freak i think i can spot the freak in her from a mile away oh, yeah. i don't even remember what this bitch looks like and i watched this episode <laughs> last night hey librarian keep that neckerchief on let's do this shit yeah glasses with the chain yeah mm-hmm yeah. It makes it hotter that she's wearing old lady gear and she's like 33. It's true. It's so much hotter. It's Miss, so good. Her bra and panties don't match because she wasn't expecting it, but that's okay. That's kind of sexy. Wasn't ready. That's kind of sexy in a weird way. We weren't expecting it. Were you, librarian lady? You I'm younger man, you. I'm going to pull up my Dewey Decimal System. Oh, well, my God. So anyway, he steals the books from the library. Sorry. I did make that weird for you guys. It, it was a little weird. Mm -hmm. I need my paddle. He it runs so away with the funny. books. It's great. He runs away, and then we get uh, what I'd like to call a very touching scene between Will and Bob. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. This is great. This is total fatherly advice. Probably the first time he's ever gotten it. Stepdad advice. Outside I of call Jonathan. It. Yeah, I, I would concur. Well, true. That's very, true. very important. Mm -hmm. Definitely stepdad advice. Yeah. 
He's giving them. Well, never mind. It's a dumb joke. But um, oh, oh Bob my. asks Will if he had a nightmare, and Will says no. Bob discusses Mr. Beldo. Oh. He was Pennywise, by the way. I guess so. <laughs> Just right. roll that out there. Bob 100% interacted with Pennywise the clown. Yeah, he wanted to give him a balloon, white gloves. Same universe. Like Pennywise. Yeah. And then, um, essentially, the story is, I confronted my fears. I stood still, and it's what made everything better. Easy peasy, right? He stood his ground. That's um, I don't know if this advice is going to be, he's going to work out in the end. I mean, it's good advice if you're not dealing with the upside down and otherworldly creatures. Exactly. I think Will, Will took that advice a little too literally. You could, I, I love that you could see him really. His face. Tuning, like tuning yes. in to him. Like he, like I, I like it later on in the episode where, when Bob's talking to Joyce, he's like, I think we were kind of bonding. And like, he's kind of right. Like, he, like they were. you really can see Will paying attention, close attention and taking it all in. But damn, bud, you applied it to the wrong situation. Ouch. Mm. Right. That's the thing that this is normally great advice to a kid in this situation, to a normal kid in this type of situation that's having nightmares, that's scared of something. Right. He's giving great advice in a normal situation. But Bob doesn't understand the situation. So it's actually terrible advice. And the problem is, is that Will so badly wants to be normal. And Will just said in the last episode, like, Bob's okay. He treats me like I'm normal. Mm -hmm. That he is like soaking this shit up. Yeah. It's funny that this is also an auspicious, as Matt likes to say, an auspicious (laughs) indicator as to just how Bob is not really in the loop despite trying, right? I know the scene isn't about that, but it also reminds us that even though Bob gave good advice, and how could Bob know this advice would not turn out well? It doesn't turn out well for for Will to not run in this situation. Right. It turns out pretty poorly for him, which, like you said, Bob Bob's not trying to hurt him. But I think it's also just a further inherent division in Bob's ability to get close to the buyer's family. Correct. Right. Which is part of the problem here. He's sort of being inserted into the situation and attempting to navigate it the best he can and doing as well as he can, as well as to be expected. Right. Let's talk about Max and Lucas and um, talking about Will's nickname. This is pretty important. This is. So this is cool because they're letting her in on some intimate, important information, right? Yeah. This is is sort of like an olive branch to, to tell her something that would be brutal for, for it to, to get out. And she doesn't quite understand. Lucas explains that, you know, that f- people thought Will was dead, that there was a body in a quarry, that this, there was a funeral. Cause she's like, why, why would he, why he was only missed for how long? Why was there a funeral? That's why there was a funeral. She starts to understand that. And Lucas says, right. although public knowledge, don't mention it to Will. Right. Right, he's sensitive about it. And you can tell Lucas is like taking pains to go around the fact that it was not another kid that drowned, but a fake body. Like, this is interesting to see that even like, kind of like what the situation Hopper's in, uh, like all the kids are kind of having to be like sworn to secrecy too. Like they can't just go around talking about this. It's cool to see him aware of that. Like, I can't let you completely in on this. I'm gonna, <laughs> he's trying to give her enough context to understand you know, why Will has this nickname, why Will is sensitive about this stuff, what, you know, that that something happened that you don't want to talk about with Will, mm-hmm. but he can't get much further than that. Right. <laughs> like, I feel bad for the kid having to be like, uh, yeah, you know, it's a gigantic government conspiracy where they engineered a fake body, you know, just, not a, just something kind of crazy, yeah. you know. And then we get this, this uh, we get this segue between the scenes, which is Will walking into the class and everyone's looking at him and you can, he can just feel their looks on him and makes him feel awkward and shitty again. This is interesting because my thought at this point when Lucas told Max about Will and then we see Max almost being like fascinated by Will in the classroom, the way she's looking at him, I'm like, oh my God. So now Max is going to be into Will and that's going to be this whole thing that are, that they're going to like try and develop this weird, like I didn't expect this like Max and Mike thing at the end of the episode. Not mm. that there's ever going to be anything between them because no offense, Max, you can't hold a candle to 11. But... <laughs> I, I thought that that was where we were going to go with this, that she was going to be like, oh, my God, I'm fascinated by Will. I feel this bond towards him because he's an outsider and I'm emo, too. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But um, that is not the way they went. So I thought that was very interesting. Cool. 
Phineas Cage. Gage. You were, Gage. You were just talking to me about this, Matt. We yeah, talked about this I, in I really, an episode. I love this yeah. story. I know. I was trying to remember the context we were talking about. That I don't. Anyway. Yeah. It's that's something about craziest... personality changes, but because that's, I mean, there. this is almost like a cute metaphor for Will, forever changed. Yes. Right. Uh, well, I mean, that's Phineas Gage is the first actual lumbotomy. Like it was, the, they. This is the first time they realized, like, oh, we can just tap a spike through this exact spot, and it mm-hmm. severs this connection in your brain, and now you're a different person and more, maybe more controllable. So yeah, this that's this is how they figured out how you could do a lobotomy. Everybody, <laughs> a fucking explosion went off and fired a a railroad pike through this guy's head. Excellent. This this is a fantastic story that when people not fantastic, it's just fascinating. I know she is. Uh, yeah. People should like if you have any interest in like personality changes and anything like that, you should Google this. It's it's a really really interesting story. It just is. saying. The, the doctor that they took him to was able to touch fingers inside of his head oh. <laughs> through the holes. <laughs> and he lived. <laughs> and this and is like lived. in the 1800s. It's Excellent. Crazy, crazy shit. So crazy. But yeah, well, completely. And like, and you know, the teacher is basically giving it a breakdown, at least a breakdown of, you know, the aftermath of it all of saying, yes, his personality completely changed. Even friends and family were saying that he was, you know, this is not Phineas Gage anymore. This is a different man. And, and of course this is, we, we can't miss how this is so closely connected to Will and him entering the scene and him being there in the classroom and being perceived differently by everybody. And that's what he was so upset about in the last episode. Uh, and this is kind of a side tangent, but there's a lot of there's a lot of theory in, medi- in in medicine about CTE being very similar. Like violent striking of the head has been known to alter personalities. Um, so it's kind of wild to think about. I know the the comedian Sam Kinison was always thought of of this. He had a terrible uh, a terrible road accident. This is mentioned on Rogan Show, and all of oh, a sudden yeah. it was totally fucking different afterwards. And not just like I'm thinking about life differently, but literally like smashed his head into a point where. It changed his personality, and he the, became this great co- comedian. Yeah, there are people who like I, I, I swear you hear stories about like brain tumors and brain injuries where people know languages they didn't know before, or yeah. different skill sets like playing the piano and things. I've heard that pretty well. Like you can wait, you all of a sudden can, and I don't know. They tell the stories about organ transplants too. I don't know how true they all are, but they are all extremely fascinating. Where to he me. gets visited by the original owner, and he's a ghost. <laughs> No, that's not what no. happens. That oh, interests okay. me, oh, Dean. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so let's move over to Dustin bursting in. Who is uh, so funny, by the way. He's all he's all uh, huffing and puffing. Essentially, he tells the kids, look, we got to meet at the AV club after lunch. I got something to tell you. They invite Max. Uh, Dustin invites Max. Dustin invites Max. And Dustin is so funny when he says, yes, my lord, to Mr. Clark. I, <laughs> I shit. died. It was so funny. Mm-hmm. Like he's <laughs> Dustin's hilarious, this kid. Right. M- Mr. Clark's like, don't make public our special relationship. <laughs> Yikes. Mr. Clark is for sure, for sure. A fucking bad guy. Mm-hmm. God, you guys are so. <laughs> you guys are so hard on Mr. He's, Clark and Mr. Wheeler. He's no Mr. So, Wheeler. <laughs> yeah, it is so uncalled for. They might work together, but we all know Mr. Wheeler is a mastermind. Mr. And Mr. Clark just picks up the kids. Okay. Mr. Clark is the inappropriate toucher. Yeah. Mr. Wheeler oh, God. has a trunk full of runaways. Yes. They're both just boring, milk toast mm. 80s white guys. That's all they are. Says Mm-mm. the investigative journalist <laughs> right before he says they found a bunch of dirty, decomposed, stinky bodies in his trash bins. <laughs> Maybe. These Maybe. things are all true. So let's, um, let's move over. Hopper at the station talking about the pumpkin blight. He spots a pattern on the map and circles it. And then we hop over to the cabin in the woods, right? Yeah, she wants to go visit Mike through the TV, but she doesn't. She decides, I'm going to go see Mike for real. Heads over to the door, has a flashback of Hopper taking her to the cabin. So here's a good indicator as to where her hair's at. So looks like a few months she probably spent outside. Uh, you're an expert on how women's hair grows, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like I can tell based on the inches that it Enhanced. has been one Enhanced. month Three weeks and two days, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Had the curls started to form yet, Dean? Um, that's usually by the third month, depending on which conditioner she uses. 
<laughs> oh, oh yeah <laughs> let's ask her that <laughs> hey have you been fucking using canteen no 11? just squirrel guts <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah. so the curls are not ready yet <laughs> oh, God. jesus but um i love her cute little sauce curls by the way did not realize she had curly hair that's funny yeah but, okay funny. well so it's but it's a factor it's not like she just fucking grew her hair in three weeks she had a fucking shaved head they're showing us to give us an indication as to how long she's been in the fucking woods. I know you are just so funny about how you are obsessed and an expert on her hair. And I will think about this forever now and be really creeped I'm very, out. I'm very obsessed with it. <laughs> yeah, I, know, I think it's safe to say, you know, maybe two months, three or so, probably tops. Based I mean, on, when, based when on we what? we see her I, hair length, I guess. <laughs> oh, 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 we got another hair length expert. Uh-huh. Coming for the throne. No. As I was just paying attention to the weather and thinking about that. But you weirdos oh, are oh, studying her Johnny, fucking hair length. <laughs> Johnny fucking weatherman over here, paying attention to the fucking seasons. <laughs> Wetting his finger, sticking it in the air, making assumptions. <laughs> Jerk offs. <laughs> oh my God. I can't. Anyway, this is, the, of course, the, the, the original meeting of her getting a cabin. We're, we're building some of this. Um, Matthew, what do you think about establishing these these past images, these past I, well, things? I I like it, and I think it's pretty crucial too. Because one of the on my second watch of this episode, I I kind of was trying to remember. I was like, did did Eleven and Hopper interact at all last season? Like, I don't remember. Like, I I when I when I thought back on it, I think there's that scene in the school when Eleven goes, you know, into like the uh, the big pool they inflate for her. So that she can, you know, go into the kind of in between interdimensional space or whatever. I think that's really the only time where Hopper was like in the same room with her, really, um, because then he, him, and Joyce go off to the, the lab, and they're off doing their thing, and the kids are at the school with Eleven, and then that's where she disappears. And so he didn't get to spend much time with her. So I think it's actually pretty crucial for the show to really prove to us that they have spent a lot of time together uh, at this point. That Hopper knows 11 11 knows hopper and they've you know began a kind of relationship and i like i like this kind of montage scene this great of course very very 80s montage of them you know working together cleaning up the place setting up these little uh booby traps to alert the place if somebody comes and all this different stuff that they're doing together i i enjoyed it and we kind of get to this glimpse of how it makes sense that hopper would even think to go after Eleven to to be putting out food for her, to be concerned about her because he was once a dad. Like it's something yes. about his character that I believe that he would that that hit, the idea that she might be out there by herself would rattle around in the back of his head and bother him, and he couldn't just stand by. And so I love I love watching them, you know, kind of grow together here, and and him laying out all of this for her. Uh, first time really that she got to have kind of a, a home of her own, like an actual nice, warm, not fucking cold lab home. Um, but yeah, yeah, this is a good scene. Fucking Jim Crow song playing mm-hmm. away, which I think at this point, I don't know a lot of Jim Crow's, but I think every song he writes is about a big bad guy. Big bad dude. Yes. Just a guy being bad. You know, don't mess around it. with Jim. This guy's name is Jim. This big bad dude. <laughs> bad, bad Leroy Brown. It's for the other, it's all bad guys. Okay. No good guys. Mm-hmm. No good guys. Mm-hmm. Here are the rules. Keep the curtains drawn. Only open the door on secret knock. Don't go out alone, especially in the daylight. That's it. Don't because be stupid. Because we're not stupid, right? Correct. <laughs> Eleven leaves the cabin. <laughs> Speaking of which, um, we kick over to Steve playing basketball. Guys, I just want to talk to you a little bit about Steve's hair here. It looks like what he's doing is he's doing a, a feather. He's got a little bit of length in the back, and uh, he's definitely going with a Vidal Sassoon. Uh, he's got a shine in his hair, and I can tell that it's uh, he's probably been growing it about for approximately 18 <laughs> months, if you were wondering. So, uh, there we are. There's oh, the, thank, you. thank you for weighing in. Coming in we know, you're, we know you're called away to CNN and Fox all the time. You, you, you provide insight on hair length. Uh, we know you're a man in high demand, Dean. It's but thank true. You. Thank you for it's making that. It's a very good point. That's a long time for a dude to grow out his hair. <laughs> oh, yeah, So absolutely. Uh, Jessica, take me through the uh, basketball scene where it definitely looks like Billy's humping Steve at one point. Because oh this is why I'm going to take you through the scene. The following reasons. Billy is... Bodied up, huh? A fucking... You're feeling it now. Shitbag. Yeah, you're feeling it. <laughs> and Steve is a normal person who is my friend now. Matt, you missed the last recording. 
I told uh, I told Jessica she'd be a fan of Billy before the season ends, and she Ooh. is no. vehemently de- denying. This. I'd rather kill myself. I hate him. But, but but what if Jessica? What if he <laughs> he lets that crustache he's got going there his fucking <laughs> shitty sixteen year old crustache blossom into a full blown deputy Dewey mustache? Would Stop that change that. your feeling? <laughs> what? Is, oh my god! <laughs> no. Anything? It would not. Nothing you feel would change any, my feelings any tingles? about this guy. He's the worst. Okay. <laughs> he is a piece of shit. And I hate his gut. I can't stand him. Thank you. He's like the worst. It's the worst person. But then Thank again, you. and the show I think is totally doing this on purpose. Of I course. felt pretty much the same way about Steve at this point last season. I was like, ugh, fuck Steve. This is my life. Is I felt this way about Steve last season, and then I came around and I love Steve. But I'm not going to come around on Billy because I can see what they're doing, and I'm not so going to fall for their shit. Okay. <laughs> I will is not. This- is this the trick every season of Stranger Things is going to play on us? Like, the next guy they're going to introduce is just fucking Jabba the Hutt. Just, bleh, yeah, fuck everything. But then the season, we're like, Jabba the Hutt was the best character in the show. We saved the day. <laughs> season. Steve, Steve and Billy are all friends. They're like, man, I really don't like Rodney the rape slug. Ah, he's awful. But then by the end, he's so great. The last episode of season four, Harvey Weinstein's not bad. <laughs> You really uh, the oh, Duffer brothers does. are just fucking Weinstein apologists. That's their long con. Mm. <laughs> Fuck. We'll show you. Mm, that's fucking funny. We'll man. make you love him again. That's awesome. Gross. Not going to love Billy. Bye. <sighs> Hell yeah, no. Dude, this guy dude, sucks. Dude, I, dude. I do. I am with you on that, though. Just, I fucking hate this guy. He's so awful. He's so easy to hate right now. Disgusting. Love Nothing. Him. I'm, uh, you don't even need to show him to me. <laughs> Dean, in this show. was Dean in high school. It wasn't, I love it wasn't this guy. Dean. He's like, I had that mullet, and I also beat up people. Did I have a pencil thin start. mustache? Yes, at one point. I did. Oh, you had a long whiskeys. mullet? I had a pencil thin for a minute. Do you have the mullet? Hmm? Do you have the mullet? Yeah. A little bit. The, the nice ass and the jeans they talked about in episode one? <laughs> I was bodied up. That's no fucking lie there. Ever you since. just love his Terminator boots. That's all you're about. <laughs> God, those boots are good. Yeah. Well... He's better than Steve at basketball. That was my favorite no, thing. That's for sure. You know what I love about this scene? To to play you know what I love about this scene? This is the classic preppy sport kid fucking playing basketball. Thinks he's going to be better than the fucking, than the, than the other kid who's not traditionally known for being in sports. Other and he side just gets, of the tracks. That's right. He takes him to the hole. A little around the back under the legs layup. Take that, rich boy. Aww. Take that, rich boy. I was Take gonna... that, Southie dick. Take that, Southie dick, Okay. I I basically wanted to say, like, listen, Billy is a lot bigger than Steve and IRL. He's like way older than Steve. But in truth, the actor who plays Steve is three years older than the actor who plays uh fucking Billy Bob really? guy I hate. Wow, so. I wouldn't have guessed that based wah, on wah. physique either. They're both children. One's twenty five and the other's twenty two. Okay. That's right. <laughs> um, twenty two. Anyway. Just saying. All right, moving on. Yeah. <laughs> We get to the we get to the alleyway disagreement between Nancy and uh, and our boy mm. Harrington. Steve's taking a taking a whack here. Oh, Steve. you still love and support Steve in this moment? Do I? Yeah. Yes. Okay, go for it. Talk Why to me. Why would I not? Take me Nancy it. shows up and she's all harping at him. Oh, Steve, why don't you pick me up for school? He's like, Nancy, you basically left with Jonathan Byers, your new boyfriend, and also. Told me you hated me and then I was bullshit and you didn't love me. She's like, yeah. Oh my god, I was so drunk. I don't even remember that I said that. He's like, But do you love me? And she's like, Oh, not really. <laughs> <laughs> and Steve is like, I will not tolerate the shit. I've been in therapy and I know I deserve more. And he walks away. <laughs> I got more walk power back in to there, get my ass kicked to basketball. Go Steve Harrington. You be a stronger man. You walk out on that relationship with that woman who wants to bang the cokehead, okay? Mm-hmm. Let it go. Honestly, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm like, they should, this should stop. This should stop. She should get with fucking Jonathan. He should fucking, I don't know, nail some other. Give Steve a new girlfriend. Broad. We don't want to write him out of the show because we love him now. But just just give him a nice girl or make him gay. Maybe he dates Bill and turns him around. I don't know. I'm fine with that too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Junk fist in the chat. Stick up for yourself, Steve. Fuck Billy to make her jealous. <laughs> That's what I would say if I was Billy. I would say that. Dude, that's a power move. Holy wow. If Steve and Billy are a couple, that is the only way I'll come around on Billy. Okay? Walk up to her, crush a beer can on your head, say you want to fuck. Get back back at your boyfriend. No, no. I want (laughs) Billy and Steve to hook up. Okay? 
new boyfriends. Done. That's true. What? There we go. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's my new relationship. I'm going. I'm going that way. It's dumb. It's Shit got no no hard. water. Got no traction. Zero zero things. <laughs> All right, I'm just saying. Gotta well, make them likable somehow. Matt, what's your take on this this argument? I yeah. This again. This another. This show is good at presenting the conflict in the sense of like, ah, I see where they're both coming from. Like nobody's the villain, just totally wrong or totally shitty here. Uh, I get why Steve would be so pissed off. I'm pretty much, I'm not gonna lie, I'm pretty much in Steve's court with this, where I'm like, yeah, you, you were real shitty to him, and then you, you know, yeah, you were drunk. That gives you, that gives you a little bit of leeway, not just a free pass. Um, I mean, that last episode, like you guys just talked about, it, I mean, she, she says it. He's kind of even busts her balls about it a little bit here, where he's like, bullshit. You called me bullshit. You called this bullshit. You called everything bullshit. Like, because she did say that so many times, just like staring right at him, like, you're bullshit. We're bullshit. This is all bullshit. And he's like, well, fine then. Mm-hmm. So I, I pretty much don't blame him for being like, um, we're kind of done here. Like, I obviously don't think that he's calling it off in the scene. I don't think they're like, done for broken up permanently uh, i don't think that happens this early on although i think it may happen in this season if i had to guess um but yeah i'm, I'm pretty much with steve here and because the, especially the scene we get a little bit later on once nancy's talking to jonathan again i'm like you are just you are afraid of how you actually feel this is pretty mm-hmm. much what's happening Got i agree it. that's it man Hey, Matt, have you ever um, gotten drunk, like really badly drunk and said some shit you didn't mean? Totally. <laughs> Were you a bad person for that? Bad person? No, but I also wouldn't blame the other person for being like, fuck you, I don't want to hang out with you more. I'd be like, nah, that's fair. How about you, <laughs> fair. Jess? Yeah, I do it all the time. But the point is, it's not just this one situation where Nancy was drunk between him and Nancy. We have been building to this, and Mm -hmm. every scene of him and Nancy leading up to this moment has hinted to us that this has been an ongoing thing, where she does not love Steve as much as Steve loves her. Indeed. Because she loves Jonathan Byers. The end. Yeah. Time for them to start banging. Let's move on. (laughs) Well then. All right, let's move over to Dustin showing the boys his new pet, D'Artagnan. Everyone touches the creature. Did you catch that? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, they do. Um, Mike asks, what is he? It hates light. Uh, Mike notes that it seems to have something moving in inside of it. Uh, Lucas makes a connection. If it is an Apollo or a reptile, what is it? Will remember spitting one up, but he doesn't say anything. Uh, not yet. I believe he tells Mike later, right? He does. But this moment where he flashes back and you realize that this is the thing he vomited was like, couldn't fucking believe it because I didn't put two and two together. And when it showed that flashback, I was like, holy fucking shit. Like, it was crazy. It it gave me the chills. It, like, creeped me out. I was like, oh, my God, this is very bad news right now. And Dustin is real high on this creature. Were you thinking it was something innocent until you realized? No, I, I always knew it was from the upside down. But that specific connection I had not made. Um, it, in that really kind of hammered at home that this is a really bad thing. Like, Eleven came from the Upside Down, technically, sort mm. of. No. And she was fine. She didn't come, She wasn't born of it. Yeah, well, I, I know, but this thing was born of, like, Will's vomit, so I don't know. <laughs> what do you think of the polywog, Matt? I, yeah, I, from the second he brought it out, I'm like, that thing is from the Upside Down. Fuck that thing. Like, that's, that's right, a monster alien you shouldn't be touching or being around at all. Um, and this kind of brings me to my my one worry about this show, or this episode at least, um, as far as Dustin goes. I find it a little weird, and I'm not totally sure if I buy how hardcore he is for this creature. Like, he's like, we have a bond! It's my, my sweet baby! Don't touch it! Don't hurt it! And he hides it at the end of the episode. I'm like, he's not somebody who's lonely and without friends or something. Like he's not a desperate idiot. Like he has all these friends. They have good relationships. That's what the show is established so well. I don't get this like desperate longing for, for this little creature. It kind of strikes me as a little odd. I think the show could, could explain it or move past it just fine or, you know, incorporate it. But I don't, I don't want Dustin's own, personal arc this season to be like him concerned over this little creature and even once it's like the size of a fucking skyscraper and eating the world and he's like but i still love him like i don't want that i don't want but i love him that's my baby i'm like i don't fuck that what are you a little worried about what are you concerned here jessica well i just wonder if it's almost like they all have their 
you don't know their things. And like Mike has this whole thing with Eleven and Will has this, this thing, which is not a good thing, but this thing that he's going through. And I wonder if like Dustin finds this little creature and he's like, this is my thing. Like, this is mine, and it's just mine. It's not about Mike and Eleven. It's not about Will and what he went through. It's my thing. But I thought that That's Max was going to be his thing. So yeah. then why didn't Lucas get to find um, Dart? What does Lucas get? Well, I think <clears throat> Lucas and, and Dustin are kind of having their first vying over a girl when it comes to Max. That's and true. Maybe, <laughs> maybe Dustin's bowing out, and he's like, I'm just going to marry the slug. <laughs> he's like, you know what, Lucas? You got it. You take her. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of them, honestly, truly. Interesting. Maybe. Maybe it'd be it'd be interesting to see if perhaps I, I wonder if this thing will manipulate him somehow, if it has some sort of that's, to communicate I with him. I bet it does. Right. I, I'm wondering if that's why his his connection to it is so strong and so sudden that it's kind of influencing him in some weird way. Mm-hmm. Um, also, Jesse Jesse Bev in the chat brought up a good one. Uh, I just hope that this thing grows giant and saves them in the end. So she's Aww. hoping for a Jurassic Park T Rex situation here. Interesting. That this will be the puppy that grows into Clifford and comes back and saves the day. You never Clifford, know. Clifford, aw. I'm down. Maybe it maybe it fights the big smoke monster. That'd be an interesting flip on the script, taking something that would normally be a problem and raising it in, yeah, like it being the good guy in a sense and fighting the things of its own homeland or whatever. I'm not going to lie. I'm, I'm, you could, I'm not there yet, but you could sell me on that idea. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like I, I'm, I'm thinking about it. I'm kicking the tires. You can work me for a little bit longer. I might buy this. I might so do we, so, possible. so, do we feel good about the polywog and its presence in the show? And do we think we're going to see continued presence from it in the show and it's going to become a factor? What do you think, Jess? I, I think that this is going to be a plot line for us the rest of the season for sure. Mm-hmm. How about you, um, Matt? I, th- I think it will be in the rest of the show. I hope, though, that it is not a... Um, I hope its literal you know, physical presence isn't a constant of the story. Mm, I'm like, a little I'm nervous okay about it. it. Yeah, I'm like I was gonna say, like I'm okay with it disappearing for now for a little while. I mean, I, obviously, like Dustin still has it, but I'm okay with it not being a part of the next episode or two and maybe coming back. Like I don't want it to be a thing of every single episode. Like I'm not gonna lie, I'm a little bit. It strikes me a little bit too gremlinsy, you know. Mm. I don't know critters. Yeah. They like, named the fucking episode after it, so I think it's here. Yeah. But I but I am a little yes. nervous for sure. <laughs> not gonna lie, yeah, a little, little bit, ner- a little nervous. A little bit. You offended me a little bit. So the kids head out with a bell. Will hangs back, but contemplative. Uh, Bob brings lunch to Joyce. What a guy. Bob likes Joyce so much. Oh, uh, oh I love that part. <laughs> everything that comes with you, your boys. Bob Dude, says he feels he's connecting with Will. Joyce. He is speaking single mom aphrodisiac right there. Are you fucking <laughs> kidding me? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know what? It's not just you. I love everything that comes with it. Your kids, your debt, just all of it. All of you. <laughs> I'm ready to sign up. She's like, I'll take it. I'll marry him right now. <laughs> so awesome. good. I love Bob, man. It's Bob so mentions He's that the video fat. camera was a bit dinged up. The JVC. Uh, he watched the tape. Some older kids are picking on Will. He brings it to Joyce's attention. Obviously, Joyce reacts quite viscerally to this, saying she'll murder them. Yeah, rude. Uh, Bob, or, Bob, Bob sort of reflects on his own experience as a kid, saying he never really put up much of a fight, uh, much like Will. They rub your nose in it just a little bit more when they sense that weakness. Maybe it makes them feel powerful, he wonders. Uh, Bob continues, but hey, look at me now. I get to date Joyce Byers. Yuck, yuck. Dude, that is the most meta line in this entire episode because that is 100% Sean Aston being like, yes! look, I get to make out with Winona Ryder. That's I what we said, said in the first, the first episode. episode. Yeah. I was like, this is so fucking meta. It, it's so it's true. So nice. It all works out in the end, doesn't it? It sure does, Sean Aston. It sure does. <laughs> it sure does, Rudy. You're Samwise okay. Gamgee. <laughs> um, we established Bob uh, more in this scene. I think... I think we're seeing some more character development out of Bob, which continues to remind us that he is trustworthy. He is real. This isn't a wolf in sheep's clothing or anything. And if it is, it's the greatest con job of all time. But Mm. he seems pretty much on the level. Yeah, he's a good dude. I I would be disappointed and hurt if this show takes Bob into a villainous direction at the end. I'd be like, ah. Yeah, Not yeah, yeah. Sean Astin. Some people like have said that to me. They're like, "Do you think like after this episode, they're like, do you think Bob is a bad guy?" Right. I'm like, no, he's too stepdad to be a bad guy. 
I mean, no. Not like stepdad murder or stepdad. I was going to say. Like stepdad, <laughs> I love your mom so much. She means everything to me. You're my children now, stepdad. Mm-hmm. I think they exist. I've, although if, if I'm going to step, if I'm going to nestle up in my cozy conspiracy theory slippers, I don't <laughs> think it's impossible the idea of him being a fucking Hawkins Laboratory plant mm-hmm. to like keep an eye on Joyce. Like that would be some dark shit. And I honestly, like I mean it when I say I don't want that to happen. I hope that's not the case. I want Joyce to have some happiness in her life. She fucking, that's all, this season, I didn't realize how much I would feel this way coming into it. Of like, I just want them to be happy. Like every single character, I'm like, they're all so miserable and I just want them to be happy. You just love uh, them. Right. And so that's why I'm so happy about Bob. I'm like, fuck, fine. At least Joyce has some like relief and some love and romance in her life. That's good. I'm happy mm. for her. So a, I would a be. A Hawkins Lab plant would be pretty intense. It would be, w- it would be man. pretty wild. Um, the good news that may highlight that this isn't a thing is that he's known her forever and she's probably known of him forever. So it's not like he's some out of town guy that nobody really knows about. This is true. That's true. Um, so that would make that type of operation a little bit different unless they approached him surreptitiously or what have you. And we don't, we don't know. But Hopper is working with these people secretly since the end of last season, which we're going to establish again in this episode. And we've, Joyce has known Hopper impossible. for the same amount of time. Yep. So it actually is maybe a possibility. It's definitely a possibility. Yep. They kiss. So Hopper shows Owens the patterns on the map and points it out, points out the lab. Um, so this is the good segue, Jessica. Uh, Owens tells Hopper there's nothing to worry about. Hopper says, convince me. Apparently Hopper and Owens have this deal. I keep things nice and quiet for you and you keep your shit out of my town. I've done my part. Now you do yours. Convince me, Hopper says. Um, so interesting here, uh, I, I'm trying to help me, Matt, help me understand this deal. What, what do you think that is, is it quite literally that I mean, Hopper I, keeps things quiet that might spill out into regular populace? Right. I think, I mean, I think that's the basic overall of it. I mean, I think that, you know, there's that scene in the last episode of the first season where, where Hopper literally like sits down at a table with him at the lab. He's like, okay, like let's make a deal. Like he's, yep. he, they hammer out something specific right there and then. And I guess the basics of it are that, you know, to kill the, to, I, I think for, I think they realize at this point, if you're going to waste the, the chief of this town and, and other people who knew him, like you're getting, that's so many, that's not just killing a fry cook at some you know, diner. Like you're, you're getting to the point where it's going to be really hard to keep all this under wraps it's going to spiral out of control, and and if you don't kill him, he could take it to the press. He could do this, you know. This they have a nice, cozy little Area Fifty One all to themselves here in Hawkins, Indiana. They're they're making progress with stuff. I, I could imagine that they're just like, okay, like we will do our best to isolate what we do to our lab and leave everybody else alone, and we're not going to come after you or persecute you anymore. And you, but you have to also keep things quiet on our end. Not let you know. I, I bet they even try to use him as muscle to keep reporters away and stuff like that. Like I, I bet he's been kind of, you know, roped into that position by them. But I love how Hopper stands his ground here in this scene. Cause like when, when, when riser, when I guess, you know, what Dr. Owens is his character, uh, when he says like, Oh, you know, uh, that's funny. You, I, you're taking, uh, I mean, I'm taking orders from you now. No, like he says that no to him. And that's when Hopper's like, no, fuck that. This is a, this is a meeting in the middle deal. And I've already, I've come to the middle and you need to, too. And fuck you. <laughs> compromise. So, yeah, the compromise. I, I love this arrangement. I think it's great. It's cool that we have a protagonist um, working, in a sense, with the antagonists to ensure that they can continue to operate in the way they want to. Um, everybody gains something from it. Hopper gets to keep tabs on them while not disappearing. They don't have to disappear Hopper and then risk federal agents crawling over their facility. And it's cool. Uh, it, it, uh, it's neat. I really like this setup. I think it was slick. Junkfist says something pretty cool in the chat. Uh, he said, I think Dr. Brenner was crazier and more rogue than we probably realized. And mm-hmm. the new people are kind of glad to make a more peaceable deal with the locals. I think that's, that's you're right on the money, uh, Junk. I think that's... The, I, the way they even, you know, portrayed Brenner, like just his hair, just his character, like he was kind of the wild, you know, wild-eyed scientist who was just so brilliant that they kept giving him money, even though they were probably kind of worried about him. Uh, and now, like, Riser's character strikes me way more as, like, the company man. I was like, okay, I'm here just to fucking keep things running smoothly. Not, mm-hmm. not making gigantic leaps and bounds and innovation and all this crazy shit, but just keeping shit under wraps, keeping a tight ship, that's it. 
Uh, and if he can keep that nice arrangement with Hopper, he's fine with doing it. Which begs the question, does Hopper understand what's taking place in the lab? Does he just, uh, does Hopper think that there are more 11s in that lab or does he just think they're fucking around with the upside down? I mean, what do you think Hopper thinks? Because on the one hand, Hopper kind of has to turn a blind eye for, for yeah. he, he's making an, an ethical choice here to, to not run interference or not bring heat on this place that he knows was doing pretty amoral things. Right. Right. Yeah. That's, I mean, like it would really suck to be in Hopper's position as far as like knowing the kind of awful shit that they, that they did to L knowing that they personally killed people in your town and have covered it up have just been doing awful shit and you're just kind of having to swallow it and sure. And, and take the deal. Indeed. Any thoughts on that? No, I mean, I, I kind of agree with, all the things that you guys are bringing up. It's the whole scenario is a, a very strange scenario. Um, the idea of Dr. Brenner being the rogue doctor, I, I definitely agree with. I think we're, we're starting to see that, but it doesn't mean they're all good over here either. Mm -hmm. Per se. Yep. So the kids, uh, <laughs> oh, sorry. So um, let's talk Jonathan and Nancy in their, in their little discussion. Wait, which by the way, um, in the chat, Edward, Edwin Beltron just told me that they're dating in real life. Oh, there you go. And I Googled Aww. it, and it seems to be true. I don't <laughs> think she does cocaine like he does, mm. but it's questionable. Okay. Hopper shows Owen. Uh, sorry. So they have a talk. <laughs> Jonathan tells Nancy that Steve asked him to take her home. Yes, which this was brought this up brought in up, our last yeah. podcast. Um, Maybe Jonathan's just saying that to, to help is. out the situation. I think he's just being a peacemaker here. I 100% because I wrote this in my notes originally that he was lying because he cares about Nancy and her well-being in the whole situation. She's so upset about Steve and Jonathan's immediate reaction is just to make Nancy feel better to say, well, Steve was really upset, but he was worried. And so he asked me to take you home, mm -hmm. which is not the truth because we watched Steve walk by Jonathan and not even acknowledge him and Correct. leave the party. Yep. Yep. I concur. Uh, he also doesn't want Nancy to feel so terrible about her drunken shenanigans, right? Um, they discuss the shared weight of what they have going on. Jonathan admits that Will isn't the same. Maybe things just can't go back to the way they were. Nancy says, doesn't that make you mad that people just get away with these things? And Jonathan says, well, those other people are dead. Do you believe that? Nancy asks. And then Nancy says, I have a plan. She asks about Bob's job at Radio Shack. Then ask Jonathan to skip fourth period. So they got some shit going on. Got their own little conspiracy. Yeah. Theory. Making I like a this. sex tape. I um, mean. Yeah. <laughs> shit. <laughs> I'll show Steve Harrington. Ah, coke dick. Can I get a stunt dick? Um, Steve Harrington bangs Billy and he's like, I'll show you, Nancy. Wow, you're into some dark shit. I like it. <laughs> so, um. This is why you married her, right? Eleven's <laughs> walking so around funny. in the woods and, um. She's off, man. She's fucking bounced out of that place. Yeah, she's been. I love, I love how when we were establishing the rules too, when it was Hopper stating all the rules, we see her breaking each one consecutively. Mm. Yes. Uh, uh, the thing I so like about it. the thing I like about this scene and how it relates to the Nancy and Jonathan scene is that we're seeing our protagonists being actionable. They're being they're being agents of action, right? Yeah. Nancy is making a decision to do something. That's exciting. When a main character is like, here's what we're going to do, cool, versus just reacting to everything that happens, right? So I like how Nancy's making a decision, taking charge. Eleven is making a decision, taking charge of herself and walking totally. outside. Uh, she sees this mother pushing her daughter on her swing. <clears throat> oh, my God. Yeah. Eleven. And then we, yeah, we get ahead. to this fucking scene where I am like, how much is this show going to make me watch this little girl cry? Like, I can't, oh. I can't, I only got so many. Like, my punch card is filling up. I don't want to watch her cry anymore. Oh, it's so fucking so sad. Sad. Yeah. Damn. Mm -hmm. Where's mm -hmm. her mother? Is she gone? Yeah. You couldn't be I gone. Do, I, oh, I love heart. that Hopper. Yeah. I love that he doesn't fake her here. No. Nope. Right? He's like, yeah, she's gone and I'm sorry. Like, he's not like, well, well, I don't know. Maybe you'll see her one day. Like, he doesn't bullshit her. Like, <laughs> mm -hmm. It's good. It's He's honest. It's awesome. I appreciate that. Me too. It's The world could thing. use more hopper to like dads who are okay. honest with their kids and, you know, tell them about the fucking real world, but then tell them that that's okay because you're going to be okay anyway, you know? 
we divorced and yeah, it was pretty much all your fault. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth, but you're going to be okay. <laughs> if you hadn't come along, the sex would have still been great. We'd have still been in love, but uh, you know. You're going to be okay. <laughs> I got tired of fucking your mom and someday a man's going to tell you the same thing and uh, that's life. You're so. going to be okay. <laughs> Suck it up, buttercup. Want some waffles? <laughs> Jesus Suck Christ. Suck it up, buttercup. Whoa. <laughs> Suck it up, buttercup. Don't you want some waffles? All right. I don't wow. Know. Fuck. Anyway, fun. 11 cries like a bitch. You was you. <laughs> Just kidding. Hopper uh, uh, continues with his sad ass fucking cancer story. I don't know what he's talking about. It's a story he's reading it. It's not a true story. Uh, the woman in Eleven talks. She asks of Eleven's parents, and Eleven distracts them with a swing and runs away. Yeah, that is it. Fuck those people. Fuck them. All she wants to know is where the school is. Yeah. Yes. Where is school? Joyce watches the tape from the JVC. <laughs> Dude, I love... With a top-down, feed-fed VCR. Oh, man. Fucking amazing. Just I... what you need, another piece that can break in those pieces of shit. I just <laughs> love Bob, like, explaining to her how to make it work. And then I also yeah. was like, Jonathan's going to be in so much trouble. But it seems like Jonathan is getting away with his actions of abandoning Will to the bullies. Mm. Just that. Pretty, yeah, that's, that's a good catch, actually, Jessica. Because, yeah. like... He let him go off on his own, which he wasn't supposed to do. Like, he promised his mom that, yeah, you know, I'll be there with him the whole time. And she kind of has just gone. I think the, the fact that she found out there were bullies involved, it just <laughs> overrode that memory. Because yes. otherwise, she would have been like, wait a minute, Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> but she's, she's like bullies. She and sees giant some shadow demon. Yeah, she sees some Cthulhu creature looming in the, uh, in the patterns. I love me that poltergeist static monster shit. That is mm, so good. But, Indeed. But I just love Joyce's reaction. She recognizes the location with the drawing enough to like take it and trace it and realize it's the same thing. It's, 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 you know, Joyce for all her being like just a nervous mom. And like, I feel like the internet like shits on her all the time. Oh, fuck that. I love Joyce. I do too. And I, I love that immediately she sees this thing and she's like, wait a second. And she traces it, and she's like, okay, I'm right. You mm -hmm. know? Yeah. Here's the like thing. That, I like that she's not somebody who just... I, one thing I can't stand and stuff like this, and it, it is like 80s movies that this show th pays homage to so much are rife with adult characters that are like this that are so obnoxiously trigger happy dismissive of everything like ah, a kid saying it it must be bullshit like they don't give it even half of a second of thought and i love that she's not just a dismissive mom like she's somebody right. who's like well why would he say that like let me let me think about it let me look into it like the fact that she gives a shit to like let me look at the tape let me pause it let me the, she just puts effort into things which i appreciate right yeah me too i i like joyce a lot i really do i like her and then we get this, <clears throat> the final sequence here, these last 15 minutes or so is, uh, and, and we'll talk about each of these, but this is essentially Dustin breaking in. Um, Mike yells, they have to go. The polywog gets loose. They have to chase it around, which leads to this encounter that Will has at the end here. And, uh, and Mike, Mike running in all agitated happens because of a conversation he has with uh, Will that we don't see. Like Will stops him in the hallway and they're about to say something and then we, we cut away from it, mm -hmm. and we only come back. Yes. So basically, we, we just come to realize that Will is basically saying, I'm pretty sure that creature Correct. is from the upside down. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. You get a quick look in on Billy with his with his girlfriend speeding wanna, off. You know what my notes are for that scene? I wrote in all caps, who fucking cares about you, Billy? I raised um, my hand. Billy. Period. I, rose my, I raised <laughs> my hand. That's what I wrote. That's my only you note about that scene. Will, Dean, you don't care about Willie, Billy. You are Billy. <laughs> oh, Matt doesn't even know this guy's name. He's Willie. Sucks. Willie, Billy. Billy, Willie. <laughs> Billy, Willie. We matter. don't care about you. <laughs> Still a piece of shit, no matter what his name is. Totally a piece of shit. If it's any consolation to you, I was not like Billy in high school. Are you sure? <laughs> yes. Longer hair, pewter hair tie. The six pack, the, the, the ass looks so good in jeans, those like little 80s chicks all of that, Saren. All of that stuff is true. I, <laughs> I just wasn't a giant douchebag. All right. So you admitted well, what, I about ask Billy. You guys, 
I want to ask you guys real quick, though. Do you believe – what do you take on him saying, she's not my sister, when he's talking about Max? Is that literal or is that him mm. just being a angsty teacher? I, I think he's being literal, but I think they are also still – angsty. I think they're still – I think they're still siblings by way of marriage or something. Yeah, step-siblings. I think I that's assume. a red herring. Yeah, step-siblings maybe. Like his – Mom married her dad, and then they had to move to Hawkins for some reason. He blames her for it because he's a, literally a fucking loser, <laughs> and he's shitting on this sweet little redheaded girl. Anyway, I that's that's what I imagine is their step siblings or half siblings or adopted I'm, siblings. I'm in leaning some way. towards I'm leaning towards half sibling maybe because mm-hmm. there's just some some real shitty animosity there. I'm like, fuck, like, what do you, you have to be related so to, ready to, yeah. To hate each other so much. I know. <laughs> like, damn, they hate each other. Like, can't she just opt for the bus? Like she's got to ride with this asshole to school every month, every morning. We all like, made fun of Sydney and scream taking the bus every day. Max, take the bus. Yeah, that's Sydney Campbell was can do older it. than you the fucking do bus it. driver. <laughs> 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 anyway. Anyway. So Dustin, Mike, and Lucas and Will chat about Dart. Will saw something that looked like Dart last year, the same sound. They discussed Will possibly having true sight, seeing into the ethereal. <laughs> mm. Maybe Will can see into the upside down. They say they have to take Dart to Hopper. Dustin, of course, objects to this because he thinks that'll be the end of Dart, and he says he has a bond with Dart and trusts Dart. Uh, see how that the more I think about it, the more I'm like this this creature had a great high number dice roll and it has some weird fucking sway over Dustin now because this this strikes me as outside of Dustin's character. I I could get on board with that, that this thing has some type of weird like mind power and because Dustin found it, he feels this connection to it that is not in his character per se, but from the creature itself. I could see that. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what I'm leaning toward. I think that's the most, of this thing is going to be a bad guy, I think that's the most logical explanation. Right. The trap shape. Other, Go ahead. I was just going to say, otherwise, I don't, I don't see Dustin making the choices he makes in this scene. Yes. And this, like, I don't see him being, like, the way, just the sheer amount of how protective he is over this creature is it's some from somebody way more desperate? Like he is somebody with friends and with good bonds with people. He's not some desperate loser with nothing to nothing to cling to, you know. Uh, and like that's how he acts with this creature. And I'm like, that's not Dustin. That's fucking weird. Hmm. I don't know. Or maybe he's just never had a pet before. He's just one of those losers. But he had a turtle and he evicted it. I think. True. I think people who 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 tend to have pets and are and do allow themselves to bond in or get closer to animals or probably have a closer bond than somebody that doesn't have pets. I think people that don't or don't have bonds like this would probably just dismiss this as whatever versus somebody who, like, you know what I'm saying? What you're trying to say is Matt doesn't have a pet, so he doesn't understand. No, I'm not. Like I'm saying, do. no, I'm saying that I would imagine that somebody, no, I'm saying literally what I'm saying is what I just said. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> sure how else to say it. That's what you're saying also. I'm not saying any. I don't know how many fucking pets Matt's had. He's had plenty of pets, I'm sure. I don't know. Why don't you ask him? I have. Have you I had have. a lot of pets, okay. Matt? Well, you, you love them? Lots and lots. No, Jessica, <laughs> I fucking threw them all into a wood chipper and watched them suffer. <laughs> legs first. Back legs first so I can hear them screaming the whole time. Because honestly, if my friends told me I couldn't have my pet, I would hide it under my hat, too, and take it away. So I, I guess I relate to him a little about that You scenario. just stuff Stella under your sun hat? <laughs> <laughs> She's writhing and kicking around. <laughs> or she'd be frozen in fear, but I'd be wearing the tallest hat of all time. <laughs> oh, fuck. That's good. So let's talk about the order. And, because I think, I think to claim, Matt, that Dustin is not acting in character is, is, pretty, is a pretty harsh claim. So let's work, oh. let's work through it a little bit. Okay. I'm okay. not saying I disagree with you. I'm just saying let's work through it. Right. Um, and Hold maybe on. you'll convince yeah, me. Yeah, evidence. All right. <laughs> all right. Hold on. Um, so at what point do you find he's acting out of character? Is it is it when he hides it under his hat? Is it I, honestly the, the the line that stuck out to me the most was when he was saying, you know, I we have this bond, I trust it. Like th- like that alone was kind of like the 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 bump of that along the normally smooth path. I'm like, mm, that's a little I wouldn't expect this from him. Just like I could imagine him having a, a really intense like scientific curiosity about it like whoa it's so crazy it's so unlike anything we've ever seen like i totally buy him being 
so fascinated with it that he wants to rent all the books from the library and learn about it and figure out what it is and be able to lay claim to some new animal discovery. Like I'm like, yeah, that makes all sense. But the point where he starts getting all like, there's this bond we have and I trust it and don't hurt it. It's fine. Like he's just so weirdly protective over it. Like it, it goes beyond it being a scientific curiosity or anything at this point. Like, I don't know. I, I start to find that a little strange. Mm-hmm. Did you find it any more or less strange than Mike's reaction, which was let's smash it? <laughs> well, Mike, once, you know, Mike is so much more keyed into to Will and his feelings and Eleven that I think he he associates anything that could even be remotely associated with the uh, Upside Down is like, fuck that, kill that, <laughs> no way, don't want anything to do with it. So I think just him even believing there's a possibility there is enough for him to kill it. Um, so I, I see where Mike's coming from, even though it's harsh. Uh, Dustin is just, I don't know, I... I Maybe if you had even established him as more of a an animal nut or something, I, I would believe this a little more. And I'm not I'm not even saying like, oh, I don't believe it at all, and it's all bullshit. This is the stupidest thing. Like it doesn't bother me that much, but it just it st- it does rub me a little wrong. Got it. All right. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So let's move to. I'm I'm jury still out. I have to. I have to I'm not. I'm not. I have to see more. Yeah, I, I'm because gonna be part of me thinks. The- you know, is he saying that because is he is he, when he says stuff like, "Oh, it trusts me, we have a bond." Is he just saying that to sort of buy time because he wants to know more? Is he does he totally understand what he's feeling? Is he being totally honest? Is he has head wrapped around his feelings in this intense situation? Sometimes people say some shit they might not mean it, you know. But I don't know. It's we. I I, I got. I'll need to see more and to see how it goes. And maybe there is some sort of manipulation going on, but. There is that moment where it uh, it runs to him when they're searching for it. Let's talk about that. Yeah, man. See, this is this is some Futurama brain slug shit where it's like, ah, my host must protect me. The one I have cast persuade over. Mm. Yeah, gotcha. No, that's true. Like, it's like, oh, you. You're yes. the one. Yeah, it knows he's going to, like, it, it seems pretty confident in going to him, which I think shows some sort of, Definitely some awareness, some pretty intense oh. awareness. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so we're seeing, essentially what we're seeing here is Dustin reacting to Dart and wanting to keep Dart safe, feeling like he has a bond with Dart, or at least thinking he has a bond with Dart. Maybe he's being manipulated. I guess that's a possibility. Um, the rest of the kids are like, this is fucking crazy. It's from the upside down. It came out of Will's mouth. It's at that <laughs> point where I personally <laughs> would not have a bond with it. So I'm just to inject my own personality and thoughts into it. Right. Once Will identified it as a creature from the upside down that he recalls, uh, I would be like, okay, we need to get rid of this fucking thing. Sorry thing, but I can't trust you no matter what. It's too scary. Too many, too many lives are on the line. And, um, and that's kind of what we have going on here. They Dude. search the halls and all that shit. I did not even, <laughs> I feel like an idiot now. I did not even piece together. I forgotten about Will barfing that shit up in the yeah. last scene of the first season. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So do we think, because remember how they found Will in the Upside Down, he was like all smushed up against the wall like Winona Ryder in Alien Resurrection. Like he was all like prepped to have an alien egg squished down his throat with a fucking, you know, alien dick or whatever that thing was in his mouth. Ugh. Um. So this is a baby Demogorgon, I think. Man, mm-hmm. the fuck, yeah. or something. Maybe uh, could be. Um, so, that's it. so a couple more things we should we should talk about. Um, this encounter between Max and Mike, I think, is pretty important. Um, of course, uh, Joyce realizing that uh, that the AV club was canceled and Will's not home, her taken off. Um, of course, we have Nancy calling the Wheeler residence. That call is being monitored. Right? Not the Wheeler residence. Nancy oh, is oh, a Wheeler. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. What yeah. the Holland? The I don't Holland? Know. Yeah. I call them Barbara's, Barb's, parents. Barbara's parents. The They're, last yeah. name doesn't matter. It's the Holland. She's like res- Madonna. It's like the Holland residence, and um, I need to tell him about Barb. I haven't been honest with you. I can't tell you on the phone. We're going to meet up. That's of course being monitored, which is cool. But does and she know, know that? <clears throat> I'm assuming yeah. because that's why she did the shit from Radio Shack. Because I read articles on the internet, and they're like, Nancy, you done fucked up. And I'm like, I think Nancy did this on that purpose. Yeah, I think yeah, I think Nancy assumes okay. that she knows, and she's going to try to set this right because the only proof she could offer is something with the lab. I think I think Nancy's aware she's being monitored. So, oh yeah, the internet is wrong, and we're right here. Maybe. Okay, Fuck good. Me. Just want to make that. 
clear. <laughs> if she if she's not aware, she's preparing something stupid. with the Radio Shack gear for Miss Holland, but I'm not sure. Mm. Yeah, I don't yeah. Know. There's we haven't gotten a reveal on what they actually went to Radio Shack for, did we? No. Like we just see them come back to the house and we're like, all right, well, we got to make this call. Mm-hmm. And yeah, do it. And I, I th- even the way she phrases that call, like we can't talk here. We have to meet up here at this specific place. Like she's she wants the, yes. the Hawkins Lab people to meet to to either meet them there or be you know observing them there too. Like they're, they're she must assume something. based on she, she knows the stakes involved because we've already established that through her discussions with Steve that they're really bad people and nothing can be said and those bad people know what's going on. It's not out of the realm of possibility for her to assume that they know what the fuck's going on or they're listening in on shit, right? Right. Totally. Right. That, that was my first assumption if if uh, maybe I'm giving her too much credit. No, I think I think she's aware of that. <clears throat> okay, cool. Uh, by the way, I like how Lucas jump kicks the door. But anyway... Um, Dude, that shit was good. That was funny. Um, Excuse me, young man! <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But um, Owens, Hopper, and some men gather up some samples, right? Hopper's deputy just talking to a woman that saw Eleven. So these are all layers for the next episode. Eleven runs to a bike rack, remembers riding her bike with Mike, of course. And then um, let's talk about this this shit with Max and Mike. And then let's talk about Will's encounter. Yeah. So Mike runs into Max while they're searching, right? That is it. In the the locker room of the, the, the big auditorium. He's talking about their character classes. We don't need a mage. L was the mage, and she's like, I could be a Zoomer. He's like, that's not even a thing. They argue some more. Eleven overhears that we got these near misses with Eleven and Mike in the hallways, and now she's watching Mike interact with Max. Dude. The Painful. lead up. <clears throat> oh, the, yeah, the music changed and the lead up knowing to where like, oh, fuck, she's going to finally get to see Mike again, and she's going to see him interacting with this other girl and totally misinterpret it like i it was just as much of a, a heart wrench for me as her the scene of her learning about her mom i was just like oh fuck no how <laughs> much how much will this show make 11 suffer god damn it a lot it is painful a lot. it, it really is and again millie bobby brown she's so really good. fucking good i like that we're kind of burying this mike and max thing early this would have been a dumb thing to go on for too long there is no Mike and Max thing. I'll kill myself. I'm burying sorry. meaning their yeah. their beef. Oh, I thought you meant like them being burying a couple his of some dick. Sort. <laughs> what you weirdo? <laughs> what the fuck? No. no, like burying this beef. I didn't want there to be this constant like whatever. Yeah, that's yeah. Cool. yeah. You know what I mean? I agree. This her on the outside of the group and being like, "Why is Mike not like me?" Like, yeah, I got, I'm for that. Just kind of being resolved. Yeah, um, and Max describes this magnet effect when she falls off her board, and Mike knows of this. He's probably felt this power before, right? Mm-hmm. So he, he yeah. that description rings true to him. He runs to the door. No such luck. Eleven has jetted out of there. Yeah, yeah and like like you were saying, uh, Jessica. I mean, my, Billy Bobby Brown can like, like wear pain on her face yes. in a way that I didn't think 11 year olds could even muster up. Like I was like, God, like she just has that, that, I don't know, like traumatized, you know, history of pain on her face. And I'm like, how, how can you do this? Your kid. Uh, it's so, so good though. But also kind of, uh, I'm worried a little bit about her vindictive streak here. Yeah. Like, I like oh, it. he's, she's, he's talking to another girl. Fuck that girl. I'm going to crack her head on the, <laughs> on the yes. fucking wooden floor. Like, damn, bro. <laughs> but we already it? saw her, too, get angry with Hopper and, like, throw something at him with his mind. Mm-hmm. It, it's yeah. it's very interesting. Yeah, it's and cool. You know that. You know that ruined Hopper's day. He's like, fucking, I had syrup on that. It's all in my hands. It's forever mm-hmm. now. I'm sticky hands, man. That's right. It's, it's crazy. Cruel. So, uh, of course, Joy's screaming off in her car looking for, uh, well, Will enters the bathroom. We hear D'Artagnan's noises. Um. This is where Dustin hides D'Artagnan, and then uh, Mike asks where Will is. He's in the upside down. Will's running away. He recalls Bob's words of standing his ground. Will turns. The massive creature reels. Will says, go away, go away, go away. He's crying over and over. He's scared, but he's fighting through that fear, which is good shit by Will. The creature seems to push itself into Will by way of eyes, mouth, ears, etc. And then we have a hard cut to black. And then As he looks up. As he looks up, yeah. Wow. Ugh. Just him flashing back to like Bob being like easy peasy. And mm-hmm. He's like basically being <laughs> yeah. consumed by a demon. Like, come on. Ugh, Bob, you fucking really awful. fucked up here, guy. Good shit. 
So that's the end of the Polywog. Awesome. Man, I'm glad we uh, I'm glad we were able to talk about this one tonight. It's nice doing a little double header here. Double uh, header. What are your final thoughts on Polywog, Matt? I like I said at the top, man, really, really enjoyed this episode. I'm a little bit I don't I I, I, I could see the show having a minor misstep with maybe spending too much time on this actual little polywog creature. Like I don't wanna I don't wanna be saturated with that. Um but on the whole, I like I like where all of the the character relationships are going. Um, I like like what you said, Dean. That this kind of this awkwardness between Mike and uh, Max is maybe not been totally resolved, but it, it's heading towards something where he can stand being around her. That the group can kind of all be together without these weird fault lines between certain kids and not the others. That's cool. I like that we've come there. Um, as far, as far as poor Levin, I'm so. I'm already so tired of watching her suffer. I'm like, no more. Give this kid a fucking break. Um, but yeah, man, this was this is a fucking good time. This this show, I don't know how they've done it so far. Of like, it, basically no mistakes, man. It's it's all been so fucking enjoyable. Uh, watching watching the show again, you know, getting into the second season, it made me realize after watching it, I'm like, God, you guys really did. You borrowed a lot of Stranger Things flavor because mm-hmm. you knew it was the right flavor. You knew it worked uh, for sure. I mean, their formula, man, is still fucking strong. It's there. Um, so, yeah, this, this is a strong episode. And I – going as far as what I think might if, – if I can speculate for a second, um, I don't think we're going to see Will – disappear into the upside down like he did in the first season. I think that would nope. be a weird I agree. Move. No way. Um like they're not going to take him away. Like this this smoke monster enveloping him I think is going to fuck with him and and really upset him for one and I I wouldn't be surprised if I also was going to you know take a stab at guessing about what's going to happen. I wouldn't be surprised if his voyages, his ventures into the upside down when he gets pulled in like this start lasting longer and longer. Uh, over time, like, you know, him him being kind of a being between two dimensions, he starts getting pulled further and further into the upside down one, spending more time there, even though he doesn't want to. Um, I could see that happening, but I don't think it happens here. I think this this harsh ending is a little bit of a, uh, not a fake fake out or anything like that, but um, a little bit of a tease. Um, so I, I think he's still going to be back, you know, and he's not going to just be gone or disappeared. Um, but yeah, man, this, this was great. This was a great episode. Jessica? I, I really love this episode, too. I thought it... I felt like the first two episodes were really establishing a lot of stuff, and in this episode, things happened. Mm-hmm. We see Eleven leaves the cabin. She goes to actually see Mike. She sees where his life is now. We see this whole dart thing, which is going to go however it goes, but it gives these people, some, these kids something to do, and this this thing to be involved in together and to have different opinions on. Um, you know, we see... Nancy deciding to do something. We see her and Steve temporarily parting ways and her going to Jonathan. Um, and then we, we we get this stuff with Will at the end, which I agree. I don't think we're done with Will in the show. I think Will is going to stick around, but I think this is going to have some serious repercussions and it's going to be very interesting to see what comes from this. Like, is he going to be possessed? Is he going to spit up more little darts? Like, what is going to happen here? Good question. I think that um, perhaps the tale of Phineas Gage is it. Mm. Perhaps that was a a foreshadowing versus a metaphor for Will's past travels. Perhaps we're foreshadowing future travels and that now he will have experienced his uh, Phineas Gage moment. And perhaps when uh, he awakes that he will have uh, something different going on with him. Um <clears throat> So I'm curious about that. I don't think he's going to be gone in the upside down world. I think that these encounters that he's having in the upside down um, are going to alter him in the regular world. And that's what I'm Mm -hmm. looking forward to. And um, I'm looking forward to it, man. I think that uh, Will is an interesting character. I'm excited to see more from him. Um, I, I am a touch nervous about the whole polywog thing, but stranger things uh, has, has yet to disappoint me. So I'm going to, continue to give them some faith here until they uh until they give me a reason not to give them faith totally. and i'm excited about my trust indeed and i'm excited about all the interpersonal relationships and uh and that's all i have to say so with that i think we are going to say goodbye to everybody um thank you for tuning in we'll be back next time with the fourth episode 
And don't forget to visit us on the web at libertystreetgeek.net. That's libertystreetgeek.net. We have a bunch of podcasts. If you just found Stranger Things and you like it and you like podcasts, we cover movies on the Science Fiction Film Podcast. We cover The Walking Dead. We cover Game of Thrones. We have a fucking true detective podcast out there. Why we you have, always bring that shit up? It's we embarrassing. Have, we have an X... Ex- <laughs> it was a good podcast. <laughs> We have an X-Files podcast out there. We have podcasts for days. You should get out there, listen to them, check them out, and for sure share and subscribe to these shows. Again, LibertyStreetGeek.net. we got a lot of things out there for you to consume. If you need more LSG media in your life and Stranger Things just isn't cutting it, there's a lot of content out there. Uh, 200 plus films we've covered on the Science Fiction Film Podcast. And if you're watching Stranger Things, we think you might be into some science fiction. So for sure, check it out. And in the meantime, we'll catch you guys next time. Have a good one. Bye.